Now that's the way a holy night should be done <laughs> right there. Thank you guys. Man, y'all are so, so, such a blessing at presenting uh, the, the truth and the reality of what the Lord wants to say to us out of this, out of all of the praise and worship and adoration and so forth. That is just outstanding. Thank you so much for all that you do, every one of you. It's just uh, phenomenal, you know. And, and I say that, and I, I know I say it all the time, but uh, I just want you to know, you know, I've been in the ministry for 45 years. Uh, everybody says that's a pretty long time. Pretty long time, right? 45 years. Uh, longer than some of you sweet people have been alive, right? <laughs> well, I'm a, I'm, I'm, I am a little bit older. I know it's, you know, you probably don't think that by, by looking at me, you know. You, you say, Pastor, you're so young. Well, you know, God's been good to me, you know, I can say, you know. But anyway, I have been around for a while, and, and it's just not, uh, that's just not something to be overlooked at how the Lord blesses you with uh, skilled and wonderful and gifted people yeah. to uh, assist the Holy Spirit in presenting to you guys his truth and his heart and his life and, and, and the realities of, of what it is to be a child of God and to enjoy the things of your heavenly father that he puts in his word and he speaks to so often. And in this Christmas season, uh, you know, it, it, uh, it, it has come to me, uh, I think, and believe led by the Holy Spirit of God that a few weeks ago I started just a little brief series and I'll finish it probably a couple of weeks. Start There are a couple of other messages besides this one and, and in the last two weeks, uh, called The Gift of Grace, a little series called The Gift of Grace. And it it really just has come out of a heart where I believe the Lord wants us to understand his grace because it is in understanding his grace that we understand who he is in our life. And the problem that we have in humanity, especially in this crazy world that we're living in today, which all of us look at and say, this thing is spinning sideways fast. Yeah. And it, it's ridiculous. It's loony. It, it doesn't make any sense. It, it, it's delusional is basically what it is. It's, it's, not even, uh, it's not even understandable to people with common understandings of life, some of the theories and the workings and the conclusions and the practices and so forth that we're seeing happening in this world that we're living in today. I mean, it's, it's perplexing, which means there's no answer to it. Yeah. No matter if somebody came and said, how would you fix this? Here, write it down right here. What would you say? How, how, how would you, what would your suggestion be about fixing some of the issues and some of the thoughts and some of the patterns of the way this world is spinning nowadays? You'd say, <laughs> beats me, God has to do it. Well, that's exactly right. Because the Bible says that in these last days, there will be all kinds of issues that happen, and it uses the term with perplexity, which just means there is no answer. And we're seeing that today. So in a world like that, what would God be saying to us as his children? He would be saying, let me be your father. Let me be daddy to you. When you have issues in life, when you have concerns in life, just lay them out before me. Just come, Hebrews 4 says, come boldly unto the throne of grace that you might obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. That means before it's too late. So God said, I'm encouraging you to come boldly. And that word boldly doesn't mean brashly or arrogantly or with pride. It means telling all. It means uh, honesty of openness. It means courage of openness. It means God says, you, you just come to me telling, saying anything to me because I know you and I created you and I love you and I understand everything about your life so you don't have to try to hide anything from me. When you come to me, just come saying, Daddy, this is the problem I'm having. I I need you to work in this in my life because I I can't do this, Dad. I, I need help. 
Dad, uh, do you have a hundred that you can lay on me today? You know, I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm broke. I, I, I need to pay something. Or, what, or, or can you give me power? Or dad, these people are bothering me and, and, and this is what's going on. And dad, I need you to speak to their heart or take care. I mean, like, like dad, just God says, just, just come to me telling me everything because you're not coming to a throne of judgment. You're coming to a throne of grace so that I can give you grace and mercy before these problems spiral out of control, is what God is saying. Well, the only problem with that is, based on how you look at God, how you view God, you're either going to do that or you're going to stand off. You're going to keep God at a distance because of your concept of who God is. And so this is really, this uh, gift of grace has been a challenge to you to see God the way he is. And the problem we all have with this is that we are evil, that humanity is evil in comparison to God. Now, you comparing yourself to some other human, you might be a good human compared to another human, but compared to God, we are all evil. You remember what Jesus said to his disciples? He said, uh, if your son asks you for a fish, will you give him a serpent? If he asks you for some bread, will you give him a rock? If you then, Jesus looking at his disciples, say, if you then, being evil, know how to give good gifts to your children when they ask for it, how much more will your heavenly Father give good gifts to those when they ask him? Now, I know the disciples are probably like some of us today looking at each other and say, did, 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 did he just call us evil? Uh, yeah, he did. He said, you're evil. In comparison to God, you're evil. So if I, being a person who is evil in comparison to God, know how to give good things to my children when they ask me, how much more is my heavenly Father, uh, who is all good and gracious and merciful and wonderful, able to give good things to his children and wants to give good things to your children. I was talking to one of our church members out here in the cafe before church, and, and, and he was describing uh, his children and, and some of the needs and how easily they came to him and how giant the needs were and blah, blah, and all of that kind of thing, which all of us parents know how that is. We face it probably every week or two. We face these kind of issues with our children. Even when they're grown, you think that when they get grown that it's going to, there'll be a, a decrease. No, 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 no. It just gets bigger. Um, it gets more money involved and bigger and broader and everything else. But, but, but when, when our children come to us as dad, we'll bend heaven and earth, man. We'll, we'll try to do everything we possibly can to meet the request of that child that we love, no matter how big it is, no matter how broad it is, no matter how... And if we, being evil in comparison to God, feel like that, think like that, and act like that, imagine what God, who can do anything and wants to do everything, will do on our behalf if we just come and say, Daddy, I need you to take care of this. Give me wisdom. I don't know how to act. I mean, I, you know what I've learned to pray when I come to God? I tell him this every day, uh, many times a day. Uh, God, I'm just a child. <laughs> That's what I say to him. I'm just a child, God. I don't know what to do. I don't know how to do this. Lord, I don't have the power to do this. What do I say to them? How can I fix this? What is it? I'm a child, God. And he says, all right. I'm daddy. That's what I'm wanting to hear. You want me to take care of this? All right. Lay it on me. And then you quit trying to fix it. I mean, don't go to him and say, Dad, here's what I need and here's how I want you to fix it. No, 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 no. no. Here, Dad, here's what I need and you fix it however it needs to be fixed. And then quit scheming and worrying and fretting about how God's going to do that. I mean, if you do that... It just means you haven't given it to him. You are still scheming, conniving, and trying to fix something. And you're trying to tell him how to do what you just asked him to do, and which you just said you're not smart enough, wise enough, mature enough, or full of wisdom enough in order to do it. And yet here you are trying to jump back in and tell him what to do, how to do, being disappointed when this didn't happen, that didn't happen. I thought you would do this. I thought you said you gave it to me. All right? Settle down. 
Quit crying about it. Quit worrying about it. Quit fretting about it. Your heavenly Father's going to take care of it if you will get out of the way and let me do it. And see, that's what the gift of grace messages are a campaign to encourage in our life, to see God the way he really is. Because humanity does not reflect God the way he is. Humanity is fallen. We are frail. We are weak. We, 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 we stumble and bumble and mutter and spurt and we grumble and mumble and our feelings get hurt. And, you know, we, we, just, we just don't represent God the way he is. And Moses in, in the Old Testament, the first person that really God ever called and, and said, let me use you. I mean, you know, God made a covenant with Abraham and come out of her and blah, blah, and your children are going to be great and I'm going to take them into a land of promise. But here's Moses, a human being, 400 years after Israel's been in bondage in a place called Egypt, been slaves and being abused and all that. Here's God speaking to Moses and says, all right, Moses, uh, I'm going to use you. Go down there, tell the Pharaoh, let my people go. And Moses said, <laughs> Moses said what? Uh, no, no. Uh, I mean, you know, from the very first moment that God and Moses and Israel met, now, you know, don't be too condemning but when I say this, but think about this. From the moment they met, when the, the moment that God met Moses, or Moses met God, and, and then they met Israel together, you, now we got, so we got this little trifecta going on between these three people that are going to have a relationship. From the t- moment they met, they never got along. God, uh, God first thing Moses said to God when God said, all right, go down there and get him. And Moses says, no, I'm not doing it. And God said, well, you know, you can take Aaron with you if you need to, blah, blah. And then Moses said, all right, well, I'll take Aaron. And all Aaron ever did was cause Moses problems. By the way, I don't know if you know this, just what, you know, if you read the whole story, he just, he was in the way all the time. His brother Aaron was in the way all the time. Never said anything for Moses. Moses got down there and took Aaron to talk. And Aaron never said a word, ever, Moses did all, you know, whatever. And then, and then when, as soon as God started delivering Israel, from the time they walked out of the town with their hands held high, giving high fives, the Bible says that they went out of Israel, went out of Egypt with a high hand. That's the way, hot dog, ah, we out of here, glory to God. Blah, blah, blah. And then as soon as the first problem manifested, like they got a little hungry or a little thirsty or there was a Red Sea or an enemy, whatever it was, as soon as there was some manifestation of something against them, you know what Israel said? God, did you bring us out of Israel because there wasn't enough graves to, to bury us in back there? Every time something went wrong, they blamed God and grumbled at Moses about, uh, well, you just brought us out of the wilderness because you wanted to bring us out, brought us out of Egypt because you wanted to bring us out here in the wilderness so you could kill us and nobody would see it. That was their attitude. They were suspicious of God the whole time. Never trusted God. Never believed God. Every time something bad happened, they just fell off and started criticizing God and accusing God. And every time, a stiff-necked people. Look at your neighbor and say, I hope he's not talking about you. <laughs> stiff-necked just means stubborn. <laughs> that that kind of opens it up a little bit, right? You are pretty stiff-necked, Yeah. Well, yeah, that's our problem, too. We are stiff-necked and stubborn. And, and, then, and, and then God, you know, he, he would, he would kind of get bummed out occasionally, and uh, he'd say, Moses, get out of the way. I'm just going to wipe these people out. Oh, we're going to start over, all right? Uh, you stand over there because I, here's what he said to Moses. I'm going to make you a great people. Let's get rid of all these because they've already, I mean, who wants them? Get them out. And, uh, and then you get over there, and I'm going to make you a great nation. And Moses said, God, wait a minute. Think about it. Don't do that. Because if you do, all the heathens, nations around here are going to look at you and say, you did bring them out so you could kill them. And it's going to be a bad testimony, God. Uh, uh, these people are going to look at you and say, uh, you do bad things. You don't really take care of your people. You do bad things to them. And so God, of course, not needing any advice, but when he heard Moses say that, that's what he wanted to hear Moses say. Moses needed to believe that. So God allowed Moses to make the suggestion. How many of you know God doesn't need any suggestion? How many of you go, there's one phrase you never hear from God? Hmm, never thought about that. Hmm. 
You never hear God say, I never thought about that. You know, Moses, thank you for the, thank you for the information. No, God allows Moses to become the defense attorney for Israel so that Moses could build a bond with Israel because Moses was going to need that bond with Israel because they used him like a dish rag. Every time something happened, they griped and grumbled and blamed God and said, we need a new leader. So the leader had to have that kind of heart, and God let Moses develop that kind of heart and let him be the defense attorney. And God said, okay, all right, all right. I won't destroy him, but here's the thing. I'm going to send my angel into the promised land because I did promise Abraham that I would go with him, but I'm not going to be able to go with you. Now, now you need to get this, all right? You need to rem remember this. God said, I'm going, to, I'm going to protect you. I'm going to do what I promised Abraham I would do. I'm taking his people in, and I'm going, to, I'm going to send my angel to get the Hittites, the Jebusites, the Hivites, the Amorites, the Termites, the whoever-ites all up in there. And I'm going to, they're going to protect you and wipe them out. But I'm not going with you. God said, I'm, I'm staying back here because if I go with you, you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to kill everybody before it's over with. Because I, I just can't stand by and watch this insolent attitude and this, and this, and this ungracious spirit and, this, and, and these stiff-necked, arrogant, hard-headed, back-biting, weak, frail, manipulative people I can't, <laughs> and I can give you a few more adjectives, but I mean, anyway. But anyway, I'm not, God said, I'm not going to go with you because if they keep on doing that, I'm not sure I can hold back on them. So I'm going to get my angel go, and I'm going to stay back here and just watch you go in, and my angels are going to do all the work, but you guys go on in because that's what I promised, and I'm a God that keeps my word, but I'm not going with you. I'm going to just stay back here. So this is where we are. There, there, God made this promise, and God said, all right, here. And then Moses says to God, this is all in the book of Exodus, and it's in your notes, chapters 20 through 32, everything I just talked about. Then starting at 20, you get the Ten Commandments, and you get all of the things about the, God gives him all the instructions about the tabernacle, the dietary laws, the civil laws, the land laws, the, people, the children laws, the family laws, and blah, blah, blah. It takes 40 days and 40 nights for God to give all this information to Moses. And Moses is up on the mountain, and the people are down in the camp, and they think because it's taken so long, evidently Moses is dead up there on the mountain, or something has happened to him. They don't know what it is. So they come to Aaron and say, Aaron, what are we going to do? And Aaron says, well, break off all your earrings and get all your gold. We're going to make a golden calf, and we're going to form it, and, and then we can worship it, and we can say, that's our God. That's the one who's delivered us. This golden calf, and not God Almighty, but this golden calf is what we need to worship, and that's what they started doing. And God looks at Moses and God says, hey, Moses, uh, those uh, rebellious people of yours, uh, they're, have, they're, they're, they're doing nasty stuff down there in the camp. They're, they, they're naked, dancing around this calf, and they're doing all kind of lewd things, and, and they're worshiping this thing, and they're saying that's their God. They're saying that little golden statue's what brought them out of Egypt and blah, blah, blah. You need to get down there real quick. Moses leaves the presence of God, goes down with the tablets in his hand, the commandments in his hand that are written with the finger of God. When he gets down there, they are, they're doing just exactly, and he gets so angry, he just throws the tablets down, boom, they break into pieces. And then Moses said, this is an abomination. And, oh, he gets fired up, and then he says, who's on God's side? And 20,000 Levites come out, and they're standing here with Moses, and the rest of the people are out there. And, God, and, and these people are the only ones with God. And Moses, all right, get your sword out and kill everybody. And they killed about 20,000 people. Yeah, yeah. And then Moses said, all right, you stubborn and stiff-necked bunch. I'm going to go back up on the mountain, and I'm going to plead for you, and I'm going to ask God not to kill every one of you. And I don't know whether he will or not. I don't know if he'll, if I can intercede, I'm going to do an offering, I'm going to do an atonement, I'm going to do everything I can to talk God out of killing everybody in this camp. And you need to pray because when I go up on that mountain, God might even kill me. Goes back up on the mountain. Spends another 40 days and 40 nights, God giving him the same instructions. God writing on the same tablets, the Ten Commandments, you know, with his own finger and so forth. And... Then Moses comes down off the mountain with the tablets, and uh, something's changed about Moses this time, and, 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 and he walks on with Israel, and it, it's a whole different story from that point. But what I want, what I want to say to you is all, what happened in this is what I believe God wants us to see, not only about God, but about ourselves. 
and how to respond to him based on who he is and not this misconception that the world would like to paint about how God really is. Because when Moses is on the mountain the second time, Moses looks at God and Moses says, God, there obviously is something I'm missing here. I don't understand something about this situation because I, I, I would kill them if I were you. They are, they are blasphemous. They are, they are double dealing. They are two-faced. They are fraudulent. They are wicked people who only think about themselves. I'd kill them, God. Why don't you? And God says, uh, you don't understand me, Moses. You know my power. You've seen my power. By the way, no one at this point in history has ever seen more miracles or done more miracles than Moses. So Moses knew about God's power. He had seen God's power, but he didn't know God's heart. So God says, what you need to know about me is not what I can do, but why I do it. You need to see my heart. And I'm saying to you in 2019 at Christmas time, you know what we see, need to see? God's heart. Because God's heart is who God is. And so God, this is, the most, this is the most revealing passage in the entire Bible about who God is. Because it's who God himself says that he is. Not, this is not a man or a preacher or a theologian or a historian representing who God is. This is God himself saying, here is what I am. And you need to see this because once you see me like this, it's going to change everything in your life. I promise you, if you can see God's heart, it's going to change everything about how you see God. And it's not only going to change how you see God, it's going to change how you see yourself in response to God. Because the world would have us believe that God is some angry ogre in heaven with the Ten Commandments in one hand and a baseball bat in the other saying, just break one more. Ooh, I, can't, I can't wait to just destroy you. Man, just jump out of line one more time, boy. I got it ready. Ooh, come on, I'm ready to... That's what the world wants us to see about God and to believe about God. That's the concept of God that this world paints and the enemy helps them paint. And God says, you need to see me like I am, and then it's going to change everything in your life. And so God comes to Moses, and Moses says, let me see your glory, which is just another way of saying, let me see you the way you really are. God says, I can't show you my face because you can't live to tell about it. So he said, get over there in that rock, like a little cleft of rock, like that little corner over there. And he said, I'm going to put my hand on you, and I'm going to pass my goodness before you. When, God, when, when Moses says, let me see your glory, your glory is the manifestation of who you are. Your glory is what you're known for, what you want to be seen as. And so Moses is saying to God, in essence, let me see the real you, God. Let me see who you really are. And Moses and, and God says, all right, get in that rock over there and put my hand over you, and I'm going to pass my goodness. In other words, God says, you know how you're going to see my glory? by seeing my goodness, because my goodness is my glory. When you see my goodness, that's who I am. That's what I want you to see about me. That is my glory. So he put his hand over Moses. He passes his goodness before Moses. He, when he gets passed by, uh, uh, God removes his hand, and Moses gets to see the backside of the goodness of God. And when he sees the backside of the goodness of God, the very next verse Verses 5 through 7, Exodus 34, is all of the description, and we'll read it in just a second. But verse 8, the very next verse, when he sees the goodness of God, the first thing Moses does, he says, in haste he fell down and he began to worship God. For the first time in his life, Moses worships God. When? When he sees God as he really is, the first thing he does is worship him because he's never worshipped him before in his entire life. He's seen the power of God. He's seen the work of God. He's participated in the miracles of God. But when he sees the heart of God, who God is, Moses just immediately begins to worship God right there on the spot. Well, what did he see? They're described for us in the book of Exodus, chapter 34, and there are seven attributes to the goodness of God. God says, here's what I am. 
And these are just stage one. You know, I said there are four stages. Uh, seeing God through eyes of the past, Moses says, give me new eyes. Third stage is the revelation of the goodness of God, which is where we are. And here's the passage out of Exodus 34. Now the Lord descended in the cloud and stood with him there with Moses and proclaimed the name of the Lord. And the Lord passed before him and proclaimed, the Lord, the Lord God. So God, he's got like a little trumpeteer type voice going, you know, this is my name. I'm the Lord, the Lord God. And so that's the announcement of his name. And then his goodness starts going. And what does his goodness look like? I'm the Lord, the Lord God, merciful and gracious, long-suffering and abounding in goodness and truth, keeping mercy for thousands, forgiving iniquity and transgression and sin, by no means cleaning, uh, clearing the guilty, visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children and the children's children to the third and the fourth generation. So he begins to show him his goodness. And what is the goodness of God? What, what does it look like? Well, first of all, it's merciful. Mer to be, and I'm not going to re-preach the whole thought, but, the, but, but to, be, to, to actually be merciful means that, that I, am, that, that I uh, give favor uh, in, in spite of uh, the situation. In other words, I, I know everything. I see everything. I, I know your past. I know your weakness. I know your faults. I know your failter, failures. I know your frailties. I know everything about you, and I still want to help you. God says, I not only know your past, I know what's happening to you right now. And in spite of the fact that you are everything as a rebellious, um, selfish, self-centered, uh, care about uh, your issues only, I, even though I know that about you, I know what's going to happen, I know how you are, I still want to help you. That's merciful in life. To be merciful is an emotional disposition. The emotional disposition of God is that he is merciful. That's how his heart operates, that he is compassionate, that he is loving. That's the heart of God. And because the heart of God is loving and compassionate, the second attribute about God is that he is gracious. Grace means to give something good, to give everything good in spite of the fact that you didn't earn it. God's emotional disposition is to keep you from getting something that you did deserve, which is merciful. And because he's merciful, he, his actions are gracious, which means to give you stuff you don't deserve. And he does that because that is the nature of God. That's what God does in 2 Corinthians 9, 8. And God is able to make all grace abound toward you. Everybody say all grace abound toward you. All right, what does all grace mean? All grace. All right, what kind of grace are we talking about? Well, I listed them in your note. We kind of, notes. We kind of looked over them last week, and I'm not going to go back through every one of them. But you know, you have financial grace, you have physical grace, you have spiritual grace, you have emotional grace, you have social grace, you have relational grace. You have. I mean, all grace means all grace. It means all the kinds of grace that you might need, and we need all of the grace. And God said that God is able to make all grace abound toward us that you always having all sufficiency in all things may have an abundance to every good work. So God, what are you like? I'm merciful and I'm gracious. And then look at what he comes along with now. Third, I'm long suffering, God says. God is willing to suffer greatly for us. <laughs> yeah, we're sheep, right? We're dumb sheep. Yeah, not on top of being sheep, we're, we're, we're just dumb sheep. Uh, uh, we're children. Uh, we're done. Well, enough said about that. We, but, but we're, you know, as children, uh, we're rebellious and we're stiff necked and we're immature and we're, and, and, and we're, and, and we're, uh, we're rebellious and we're, we're hard headed and stubborn. I mean, that's the way children are. If you deal with children, you're going to suffer. Am I right about this? Parents, bus drivers, uh, school teachers, um, yeah, if you deal with kids, you're going to suffer because they are all of those things. And so uh, the goodness of God says that God is willing to suffer for his children and not only suffer, but suffer for a long time. 
And as he suffers for a long time, he's not going to give up on them, and he's not going to get angry with them, and he's not going to walk away from them, and he's not going to turn his heart of love away from them. Look at the verse in 13, Hebrews 13, 5. Let your conduct be without covetousness, but content with such things as you have, for he himself has said... For he himself has said, I will never leave you nor forsake you. I will never leave you. Leave you means I will never walk away from you. God looks at you and says, however stubborn, ridiculous, self-centered, self-focused, backbiting, lying, stealing, reprobates you are, I am not going to walk away from you. And then he says, and I'm not going to forsake you, which means I'm not going to take my heart away from you. So I'm not going to walk away from you, and I'm not going to take my heart of love away from you. I'm not going to withdraw love from you just because you're standing against everything I stand for. I'm going to let my heart be out there, and you're going to trample on it and smash it and squash it and spurt it and, and mistreat me and abuse me, but I am long-suffering, and I'm not going to keep an account of the wrong that you have done against me, and I will never leave you, and I will never forsake you. You know what this means? It means on our worst days, God is your best friend. It means that when everyone else walks away from you, God will still be standing there beside you. When God says never, he means never. When people say never, sometimes they change their mind. God never changes his mind. God is not frustrated with you. May I tell you this, and I wrote it in your notes, and for those of you that have the notes, you need to hear this. And that is that when you got saved, this might shock you, but when you got saved, when you came to Christ, when you said, Lord Jesus, come into my life and save my soul, I waved the white flag and I surrender forever. When you did that and whatever words you used, God knew at that point that you were a long-term project. God did not think it was going to be easy for you to become the Christian, the saint, the reflector of God that you want to be. It was going to be a long, hard, tenuous process for you to come from where you are to where he wants you to be. So God knew that when you came to him. So he's not surprised that it takes a long time because he knew it was going to take a long time to start with. So God is long-suffering. God is not surprised with all of the issues that we have in life. God's goodness is he's full of mercy. God's goodness is graciousness follows God. And then the third attribute is that God is long-suffering and he's willing to put up with everything. The fourth truth about God, the fourth uh, attribute of God's goodness is that he is abounding in goodness. Gracious, uh, merciful, gracious, long-suffering, then abounding in goodness. God is good in, in, in every situation. God is good in every circumstance of life. God has no bad days. God had no, has no bad moods. If you're brought up in a moody family, you're brought up in a family that doesn't have much heart and is always harsh and angry and is moody and sometimes it's up and sometimes it's down, sometimes it's good and sometimes it's bad. You have a tendency to think about God being that way. That God's, but I'm telling you, God is not bipolar. God is not schizophrenic. God is not psychotic. God is not neurotic. God does not go up and have bad days and come down, uh, go up and have good days and come down and have bad days. God is always good. He is abounding in goodness at all times. Look at what Jeremiah 29 says. For I know, this is God talking, for I know the thoughts that I think toward you, says the Lord. What kind of thoughts do you have about me, God? Thoughts of peace and not of evil to give you a future and a hope. Every thought that God has toward you is good. God is not just good to you when you're good. God is good to you when you're bad. God is good to you especially when you're bad because the contrast is so, is so great. 
So even when you're bad and you're horrible and you do what you said you'd never do and you violate everything you said to God, God says, I'm good towards you. Come on, man. I know my thoughts toward you. My thoughts are for peace and not to destroy you so that you can have a future and a hope. That's what my desire is for you. So as the goodness of God passes before Moses, what he sees is mercy and grace and long-suffering and goodness. That's what the glory of God looks like. And God says, that's what I'm about. And then the fifth one here, abounding in truth. Abounding in truth just means that God never lies. It means God never deceives. God never breaks his promises. God in no way misrepresents himself in dealing with a person. God not only tells the truth... God is the truth. And Matthew 24 says, heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will by no means pass away. Jesus said, everything on the earth might change, but I can tell you one thing that's not going to ever change, and that is my word that I have spoken to you. Because I've told you the truth, and the truth is not going to change, and it's never going to pass away, and I'm not going to deceive you, lie to you, trick you, or in any way misrepresent myself so that you will follow something that you don't know what it is. Now, here's the trouble. In Ephesians 4, Paul, the apostle Paul, tells us the trouble with this situation, and that is that we are to speak the truth to each other. Everybody look at it and say, that's me and you. Uh huh. Yeah, speak the truth. Now, is it difficult to speak the truth to each other? No, it's not. All you have to do, the truth is not hard to see. The truth is easy to see. The truth is black and white, yes or no, up or down. The truth is the truth, and we all see the truth. And the Apostle Paul says that we are to speak the truth to each other. Here's the kicker, though. That verse doesn't end with that line. That verse says we are to speak the truth, uh oh, here's the problem, in love. Speaking the truth is not difficult, but speaking the truth in love, uh uh-oh, that's a whole other issue. And it goes on to say that we may grow up into, into him, that we may grow up in all things into him, the Lord Jesus Christ. So I'm just saying to you that God not only tells the truth, he is the truth, and when he tells you the truth about yourself, that he doesn't just come out and blast you and and, and, and blow you away, that he speaks the truth to you in love. In love means with compassion. It means with mercy. It means with grace. It means that I'll not only tell you the truth, but I do it in the most gentle way, in the kindest way, in the most loving way, in the most redemptive way, in the most forgiving way, in the most, in, in, in the most compassionate way of life. God just doesn't come out and bless you with the truth. He, he, he nudges you. He gently uh, urges you. He massages you. He speaks to you in love with the truth because it is the nature of God to be merciful and gracious and long-suffering and abounding in goodness. And that goodness presents the truth at all times so that we can be moved toward Christ. What, what is God like? Man, what kind of concept does the world give us now? The world says God is mean, God is angry, God doesn't care, God is an absentee father, God is aloof and aloft and out there in the twilight zone somewhere. God doesn't care what happens to you. He's not with you. He's not going anywhere. He's not taking you anywhere. He won't hear your prayers. He doesn't love you. Those are the misconceptions this world gave us. And I'm telling you that Jesus Christ came in order to destroy the misconceptions of God in this world. Jesus came to say, God is not like this world says he is. Whew. I'll talk more about that next week. But anyway. But this is, God says, here's me. This is how I am. If you want to know what I'm like, this is me. And then he says, He says, sixthly, look at this, forgiving. I'm forgiving. Yeah, God is always peace-seeking. What does the Bible say about peace-seeking? Blessed are the peacemakers, not the peace-lovers. We all love peace. Not the peace-desirers. We all desire peace. But the peacemakers, the ones who actively seek to make peace on this earth. And God says the reason why that's true, blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called the children of God, 
If you want to represent your family and your father, you are a peacemaker because your family is a peacemaking family. Your daddy makes peace. His, his boy makes peace. You make peace. Your children make peace. Your children's children make peace. That's a family lineage. God says, you are never more like me than when you are actively seeking to make peace in this earth with each other, within the dimensions of God, with heathens, reprobates, lost people, saved people, up people, down people, different nationalities, different things, all of the issues that we have. Forgiving means God is peace-seeking and he is willing to forgive even though in the worst of circumstances and the worst activities that you have ever done in your life. And once he has forgiven you, he keeps no record of wrong. You can't be forgiving and have a checklist of everything that you've ever forgiven. Are you hearing what I'm saying to you? You did not forget. If that list is not flushed down the toilet, you did not forgive. You can fool yourself and kid yourself all you want to, but your heart is still angry and, and driven because God doesn't keep records of wrongs once they have been forgiven. And God says, you be like me. You, you remember there was uh, Peter came to Jesus and, and he said to Jesus, he said, Jesus, how many times should I forgive my brother? Seven times? And then Jesus, and, and I'm assuming that he said that because he was, uh, he was mad at one of the disciples. You know, he, he had some little problem with one of the disciples and he was angry with them. And he's saying, Jesus, you know, um, John back there, you know, he's so hard to get along with and he just aggravates me. He's on my last nerve, Jesus. How many times should I forgive him for that? Seven times? Peter's thinking he's being gracious by saying, seven times? And Jesus looks at him and says, no, 70 times seven. That's how often you forgive him, which is just Jesus' way of saying never-ending forgiveness. Let me just ask you, if God only forgave you seven times, how much would still be on your books? How many? No, don't answer out loud. I'm not trying to embarrass anybody. But I'm just saying, if God only forgave you seven times, how many of you would still be in trouble? Yeah, yeah. I mean, God has forgiven me way more than seven times. I'm staring here. God is forgiving. And, and look, here's the classic word from God about how he forgives. Psalm 103, 12 through 14. Look at it. As far as the east is from the west, so far has he removed our transgressions from us. Why didn't he say north and south? As far as the north is from the south, God has removed. Now, because if you look at a globe, if you start heading north, when you get to the top of the globe and go over it, now you're heading south again. Come to the bottom, now you're heading north again. In other words, north and south run into each other. You can go so far north, you start heading south, and south you head north. North and south run it. When you start heading east, you're always heading east. Once you head west, you're always heading west. You know what that verse means? You are never going to run into your sin again. It means once you bring it to God, you start heading east, you will never run into west. God will never bring it back up. God will never. It's like, it's like Bertha Smith, the great saint, used to say, when you bring your sin to God, God throws it in the deepest part of the ocean and posts a no fishing sign. It'll never be brought up against you in life ever again. So as far as the east is from the west, so far has he removed our transgression. Look at this. As a father pities his children, so the Lord pities those who fear him. Respect him is the word fear there. Doesn't mean you're afraid of him. It means you respect him. And so God brings in an earthly family and says, look, just like a, a, a father forgives his children, how many times have you fathers forgiven your children? How many times have they messed up, overstepped, understepped, disappointed you, hard-headed, stubborn, backbiting, unthankful, ungiving, <coughs> immature, frail, failures, reprobates in life? And yet, you love them, and you'll do anything for them, and you'll forgive them without them even asking about it. You'll, you'll cover their frailties. You'll speak to their weaknesses. You'll protect them. Why? Because Jesus said that's the nature of a father. As an earthly father pities his children, so the Lord pities those who respect him, for he knows our frame, and he remembers that we are dust. We're weak, we're frail, we're faulted. We're failures in life. 
How many times have I gone back on my word to God? How many times have I disregarded his sacrifices to me? How many times have I spit in the face of God and laughed at the, at the, at, at the gifts of God and the sacrifices of God? How many times have I immaturely disregarded everything God did, only thinking of myself and laughing at the face of God while God suffered for me and covered for my sin and my losses? I've not always been Dr. Keith Thrash pastor. I have been Keith Thrash that did what he said he would never do, who did what he said he would quit doing, that he would never say that again, that he would never do that again. I am weak and frail and evil in life. And God knows that about me, and he knows that about you. And he says, I am forgiving to you in spite of the fact that you don't deserve it, in spite of the fact that you've never earned it. I forgive you. What is God like? God is merciful, and God is gracious, and God is long-suffering. God abounds in goodness. God abounds in truth, and God forgives. That's what the goodness of God looks like. That's what Moses saw on the mountain when God's hand was covered over him. Whew, and then he saw one last thing. God is just. Yeah. By just, it just means that there are some standards that God has. Yeah, God has some rules. And the consequence for breaking those rules for us and for those around us when we break them are very real. But even, listen, but even when we break them, which look at your neighbor and say, and we do. Mm -hmm. God has standards. God has rules, right? And even when we break God's rules, he loves us. And his discipline in our life is motivated by his love for us. Why does God discipline us? Because he loves us. Why do you discipline your children? Because you love them. You don't want their life to be destroyed. You want them to know good from bad. You want them to have the best and not the worst. You, you don't want them to destroy themselves by their silly foolishness in life, their immature disregard of anything that makes any sense. They can't play in the traffic. They can't jump off of towers. They, I, I mean, there are rules and consequences for that, and you love them, so you, you, you discipline them because you love them and you want the best for them in life. So God disciplines us because he loves us and he disciplines us for our good, not his good. Look, look at Hebrews 12. Uh-oh, let me put it up there. I didn't have room to put it right under that. If you endure chastening, God deals with you as with sons. For what son is there whom a father does not chasten? But if you are without chastening of which all have become partakers... Everybody say, everybody gets chastened. Everybody. Pastor Key is perfect as he is. Gets chastened. Absolutely. We're all partakers of chastening. Because we all need it, right? Of which we've all become partakers. Then if you're without that, then you are illegitimate and not sons. Furthermore, we have had human fathers who corrected us and we paid them respect. Shall we not much more? readily be in subjection to the Father of spirits and live. God does discipline us, but it's always motivated by his love. And now for people who are unbelievers, you may be here this morning as an unbeliever. You have never opened your life. You have never allowed Christ to come in. You've never surrendered your will. You are stubborn and stiff-necked and hard. You're still studying what you want to do with God. You don't wave the white flag. You're still puttering around and pretending that you need some more evidence. Let me just say to you that there is eternal justice awaiting you. That in eternity, there is justice of God and God will make sure in eternity that all sin and all evil is paid for. There is a payday someday for everybody. Either you are going to pay your own price or you're going to allow Jesus to pay your price for you. Why do people die and go to hell? Some of you in here this morning, you may go, when you die, you may go to hell. 
Why would you go to hell? Because you're a bad person, an evil person? No, because we're all evil. We're all bad people. The reason you would go to hell is because you refuse the gift of God that he has given to you. For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. For the wages of sin, Romans 6 says, is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. God says, I've got a gift for you, and if you die and go to hell, it's not because God doesn't love you. It's not because God doesn't want you. It's not that God won't forgive you. It's that you will not take the gift of God and let Jesus pay the penalty for you. And in eternity, the justice of God is going to prevail. So let's just review just a second, all right? Don't, don't fade out. Are y'all got, are you guys all right? We all okay? Just a little tiny bit of review. God says to Moses, will you show me who you really are? God says, certainly I'll show you that. I'll cause all of my goodness to pass before you. And God let mercy and grace and long-suffering and abounding in goodness, abounding in truth, forgiving and just pass before him. And he looked at Moses and he says, that's me, God. I mean, that's, that's me, Moses. That's me, Moses. Do you see who I am? And I want, I, I want I, call, to call your attention, did you notice, did you notice that there are seven attributes and one of them is abounding in truth and one of them is just so those two right there deal with judgment or truth or standards that are held you know, as a regard for you to face some type of judgment in life. Two out of the seven. The other five are, uh, are mercy, mercy and grace and long-suffering and goodness and forgiving. What does that say about God? That says if you see God for who he is, it changes everything. Not only does it change how you think of God, it changes how you think of others, right? That person that's beside you sitting, they look a little different now than they did about 35, uh, 45, 30, <laughs> a few minutes ago. Right, a few minutes ago. Now, I said there were four stages to this revelation. I'm going to hit this quick so y'all don't panic. There are four stages to this revelation of God. Stage one, Moses looks at God through old eyes. Stage two, Moses asks God for new eyes. Stage three, God reveals his goodness. And now stage four. And here is stage four, just real quick. Moses is a different man, and three things have changed. When God reveals himself, three things change real quick. Let me just show you the things that have changed. Number one, his worship has changed. Verse 8, which I mentioned to you, verse 5 through 7 are those seven attributes. Verse 8, very next attribute, as soon as Moses saw all this that I've just been talking about. Verse 8, so Moses made haste and bowed his head, and the rest of that should be, and worshiped. As soon as God reveals himself to Moses, Moses makes haste, which means he got in a hurry and he bowed his head toward the earth and he worshiped. And this is the first time that Moses has ever worshiped. When you see God for who he really is, you immediately begin to worship. If, listen to this. If you don't worship, it's because you don't know God as he really is. If you think that you should worship because it's the right thing to do, you don't know God. If you think you should worship because you need to earn brownie points with God and God is interested in how you perform in worship, you don't know God. If you think you have to worship him because you need to earn a place of his forgiveness and his mercy by performing properly for him, then you don't know God. The only motive for worship is that we see God as he really is, and we are in such awe of him and majesty of him that we love him so much that we can't help but worship him. And may I say to you, it doesn't matter how you worship him. You can fall on the floor, you can raise your hands, you can jump up and down, you can dance a jig, you can turn around backward, you can somersault across the sanctuary, you can stand there with your eyes closed and your arms up, you can hold your heart. I mean, you can just close your eyes and just get along with God. It, it, look, it, worship is not a performance. 
Worship is a heart that goes straight to God and communes with God because you are in such awe of God and you recognize who God is and how majestic and how awesome and how wonderful because you love him. And if you don't worship, you don't know God like he really is. Because I'm telling you that our worship of God, and listen to this, our worship of God is based totally on who we think God is. If your God is mean and angry and unloving, you're not going to worship him. If you see him as he really is like these verses describe, you can't help but jump up in daddy's lap. Who wouldn't want to worship a God that is filled with these tremendously loving characteristics? If you think your God is concerned by performance, you're going to try to impress us with how worshipful you are. You're going to come make an exhibition of it. You're going to try to show us how awesome you are because you somehow think your God is impressed by a performance. Our worship of God is based totally on who we think God is. It's a reflection of what we think about God. So you see God for who he really is. You just want to worship him. So what changed? Moses is a different man. What changed? His worship has changed. Number two, his self-worth has changed. Oh yeah, who Mo, what Moses thought of himself has changed. And I'm going to show you how this relates to you now, okay? Because you, th this is you. This is me and you. Number one, all right, verse nine. This is Mo then he said, Moses said, Moses says to God, if now I have found grace in your sight, O Lord, let my Lord, I pray, go among us, even though we are a stiff-necked people, and pardon our iniquity and our sin, and take us as your inheritance. You remember what I told you right off the bat that, Mo God, that Moses, God told Moses, he said, I'm going to send my angel, and they're going to take the Hivites and the Amorites and the Hittites and the Jebusites and the Hittites, and they're gonna, the angel's going to protect you, but I'm not going with you because I can't stand you. Because if I go with you, I'm going to have to consume you because you're going to get on my last nerve. All right, here's Moses now. After he has seen the reflection of God, of who God really is, Moses looks at God. And Moses is now seeing himself, seeing Moses through the eyes of God. And Moses is saying, God, I know we are stiff-necked people. And I know we deserve your wrath and we deserve your anger and we deserve everything that you want to do to us. But God... Look, for the very first time, I'm seeing you, I'm seeing myself through your eyes. And when I see myself through your eyes, I see someone of value and worth. I see someone who is worthy to be a reflection of your inheritance. No longer am I looking at myself as the stubborn, stiff necked reprobate that I am. When I see myself through my own eyes, that's what I see. I see. I see the truth about myself. But when I look at myself through your eyes, through grace and mercy and long suffering and gentleness and abounding in truth and abounding in love, when I see myself like that, then I see the value of my life. And I'm saying, God, don't stay back from us. Go with us, God. We can't live without you. We can't survive. And we will become a great inheritance for you. And people will love you and honor you because we're going to represent you well, God. Because we know that we are made by your hand and in your image. Listen, let me just ask you something. This crazy world that we're living in today, we teach our kids for the past 25 years that they came from monkeys and we're surprised that they're acting like it. I mean, listen, let, let, me, let me ask you this. What, what do you derive? Do, do you derive any self-worth when you are taught that you came from an accident and that you're headed to an accident? Do you derive any self-worth from the thought that, that there is nothing sacred in your life? How can we have people on this earth who think it's all right to abort a baby that's already been born? Or even weeks after it's been born, that's okay to act as if the abortion clinic and the birthing chamber are one and the same. How can people think that way? Well, it is because they're taught that there's no inherent goodness and there's no sacredness of life. So if we look at life based on society today, there is no reflection of anything sacred about life, anything godly about life. 
We're not specially created by the hand of God, and we're not the image of God, and God is not birthed into us. We're a blob of flesh that means nothing, and we came from nowhere, and we're headed nowhere, and we begin to treat each other as if that's true. And I'm just saying, when we see ourselves reflected through God's eyes, God says, you are my special creation. I have blown the image of life into you. You house my image. You are sacred and wonderful, and life means everything. So when you see yourself the way God sees you, your perception of your own worth changes in life. And I'm just saying at Christmas time this year, God wants you to see yourself like you really are in his hands, created by him in his image of value, of worth, because God loves you and God created you and you are sacred and life is sacred. And it does matter what we do with each other. So his worship changed, his self-worth changed, and then one other little thing and then one quit. His witness has changed. Now, this happens in verse 29. Verse 8, worship change. Verse 9, self-worth change. Now we're going to go down to 29 because there's a story in between. And the story basically is Moses goes back up on the mountain and he comes back again. And when he comes back down this time, here's what verse 29 says he looks like. Now it was so when Moses came down from Mount Sinai and the two tablets of the testimony, everybody say the Ten Commandments, God bring, uh, Moses brings the new tablets down. You remember he threw the others down and they broke into pieces. Well, he goes back up there and God writes some more for him. And now he's got both of them. He's got them in his hands like this and he's bringing them down. And the two tablets of the testimony were in Moses' hand when he came down from the mountain that Moses did not know that the skin of his face shone while he talked with him. When Moses comes down off of the mountain... His face is shining so brightly with the glory of God that the people can't look at his face. It's like looking at the sun. And Aaron says, Moses, we've got to put a rag on your face because the people can't look at you anymore because you're so filled with the glory of God. Now, it didn't take very long for the people to, to get that off of him. Um, and then he didn't have to wear the rag anymore. But the point being that when he came down, he had a face that was radiating the glory of God so brightly that the people couldn't stand to look at him. Now, here's the, here's the only point I want to make about that. This is not the first time Moses came down off the mountain. You remember, he came down one other time, and he had those commandments in his hand, right? And when he saw what they were doing, he threw them down and broke them into pieces, and then and people began to die, right? Then he had to go back up on the mountain and stay another 40 days before night. Now, this is the second time he comes down off the mountain. First time he came off the mountain, his face wasn't shining. This time he comes off the mountain, his face is shining. What's the difference? Whenever, right, whenever the first time he came off the mountain, he didn't know God. He knew about God. He had received the commandments of God. He saw God in the way God was before he revealed himself to him. So the first time, Moses didn't reflect the glory of God because he didn't really know God. He knew about God. He knew the power of God. He knew the rules of God. He knew the plan of God. He knew the miracles of God. But he didn't know God because he didn't know God's heart. The second time he comes off the mountain, he's, he's reflecting the glory of God because now he really knows God. He knows the heart of God. To really know God, you have to know his heart, not just about him, but his heart. And his heart is merciful, gracious, long-suffering, filled with goodness, filled with truth, forgiving, and just. And that's what God thinks about you. And that's what God wants for you. Now, if that is your concept of God, who in this room would not want to spend every moment sitting in the lap of God if that's how you really think God is? And that's what God wants from you. Come to Daddy. A cry, Abba, which is a Greek word for Papa. 
cry, Papa, and come to God and bring all of your issues to the throne of grace. Because when you get there, he's going to give grace and mercy to help you before it's too late. This is our God. At Christmas time, this is it. Yeah, brother. Is that when your light shines and will make my light shine? Yeah, you're right. And you know what God said? Uh, what Lawrence is saying, he said, is that when your light shines? Well, sure it is. You remember what Jesus said? He said, no man takes a light and puts it on a hillside and then puts a bushel basket over it. He says, God intends for your light to shine. You are light in this dark world. What does a light do? It shines. What's it good for? It shines so that people can see the reality of what is there. And so God says, let your light shine. You're salt of the earth. You keep this world from becoming corrupt because this world will teach itself that it is not sacred, it is not valuable, it's going nowhere, it came from nowhere, and, and of what value is that? It creates this crazy, loony, delusional society that we're living in right now, where life means nothing, death means nothing, people will blow themselves up, people kill indiscriminately, people shoot people they don't know, they just start splattering everywhere. Because life means nothing. Because they don't believe in God. And they don't think life comes from God. And they don't think you're created in the image of God. They think you came from a blob of flesh, a protoplasm, a monkey, or whatever it might be. But God says, no, 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 no. no. you got to show them different than that. And this is what God does in our life. All right. Uh, 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 we could talk all day. All right. Back. <music>